Hey guys, welcome back to my video. Today we're going to be talking about feeder insects. We're going to be going over the pros and cons of having each, the benefits that feeder insects like this have, and what type of animals benefit from having feeder insects like this as part of their diet. We're going to be covering a lot of different uh, species of feeder insects that are readily available in the pet trade. So be sure to subscribe to my channel because I do make a lot of animal videos and I make a lot of videos about exotics. Now all of the insects that we're going to be talking about in today's video are easy to find in the pet trade. There are certain, um, I think, species of roaches that aren't allowed in certain states. There's some restrictions on that. Um, so just be sure to check that. Now all of the insects that you feed to your pets should be gut loaded. This means that you provide them with food 24 hours before serving them to one of your pets. This makes them a lot more nutritious and gives them their full potential of value for the meal that you're going to be offering to your pet. And then you should also dust your insects with vitamins and calcium at least once a week. Now it does not have to be at every feeding, but you do need to have a routine going so that your insects are being able to provide your reptiles or other animals with vitamins and calcium. Now just remember that a lot of the calcium supplements do not have vitamins in there as well. Now the type of animals that you want to provide D3 calcium for is animals that need UVV light, um, but I actually like to just provide it for all of my reptiles. So remember, don't forget to dust with calcium and vitamins. So this video is going to be about live feeders. Now you can find a lot of insects that are can dehydrated or even dried, but live insects should be a regular part of your reptile's diet. They are the best option for the nutritional value that they offer to your reptile. Now canned insects can also be a good choice. Of course, dehydrated or dried insects, they're going to start losing nutritional value, but dried is is definitely the worst one that you can go with. And then of course always remember to supervise your reptile when feeding live insects. Really quick before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank the sponsor, which is Levoid Tower Fan. This fan is something I'm using in my pet room because it is safe to have around animals and because it has several neat features. It is a really tall fan that offers coverage from top and bottom, which can blow air in different directions. The top part of the fan turns 360 degrees so that you can use the fan to circulate air through the entire room. It has an LED screen that offers multiple options in the settings and also has a remote as well. You can control the speed of the fan and it also offers changing breezes to simulate nature, which is really cool when you have exotic animals in your home and you're trying to provide them with a naturalistic experience. It also has a timer so that you can leave it running while you're gone or during the night. It does have a nighttime mode to help you feel more relaxed. The fan is able to detect the temperature of the room and respond based on the settings you select. There is a memory feature that allows for you to program certain settings so that you can pick out your favorite features. This fan is the best type of fan you can have around animals because they will never come in contact with the blades of the fan. Check out the Levoit Tower Fan in the link below in the description of this video. So let's start off first with my favorite feeder insect, which is Dubia roaches. And these are very easy to find. Uh, usually you have to order them. They can be a little bit difficult to find in pet stores, but they're super easy to get. They are one of the healthiest options for your pets. You can almost always find the right size for your pet, whether you have a baby gecko or an adult chameleon. They are incredibly easy to contain because they do not climb on glass or plastic like most roaches. They do not smell and they're not noisy and they also are very easy to breed. Dubia are an incredibly healthy option for feeding your animals because they have such high nutritional value. It's the equivalent of feeding about four crickets to one roach. And this is because they have so much tender meat on their bodies compared to crickets. Crickets are about 18% protein while dubia roaches are about 36% protein. Roaches also have more calcium and they have a better calcium to phosphorus ratio. You can kind of think of it this way. Crickets are junk food and roaches are power meals. Dubia roaches do not stink, they're easy to clean, and they're easy to contain because they can't climb glass or plastic, so you can keep them in plastic Tupperware containers like this. 
and they won't be able to escape even if your lid isn't super secure. So that makes them pretty hard to actually lose in your house, which makes them a great option for people who are worried about insects running all over their home. Dubia are easy to breed. They do not eat their young, so you don't have to worry about separating them when breeding. Dubia roaches come in all different sizes because when they hatch, they're very small. And as they grow, they start to get much larger and are about almost two inches when they're adults. So during the different growth stages, you can feed them to all different sorts of animals. My baby gargoyle gecko eats roaches that have just hatched while larger adults are fed to my bearded dragon and sugar gliders. Other pets that benefit from these type of feeder insects include chameleons, all types of geckos, small animals like opossums, sugar gliders, and hedgehogs. They're really great for just about any type of animal that's naturally going to eat an insect. The only negative things that I would have to say about dubia roaches is that one, they are slow growing and two, um, they don't move around too much. So they are slow to grow, but this can be a good thing and a bad thing. With smaller animals, I have a food source that's available for much longer. Whereas with crickets, they grow very fast and have a short lifespan and tie right away. So I have to feed them quickly, while as the roaches, I can keep them around for much longer. But if you are feeding larger animals, then you do have to be a little bit patient in waiting for these guys to grow. They do have a lifespan of about 24 months, which is a long time compared to a lot of other insects. The other thing is that these animals do not move around too much, and they're not able to really climb any surfaces. So if you're going to be feeding them to your reptile, you want to put them in a small bowl. The bad thing about this is that it doesn't really trigger too much of a feeding response sometimes and can be difficult for your reptiles who are refusing to eat. So they're a good food source, um, but they're not going to encourage the reptile to be super active. So even though I recommend this to be a big part of your reptile's diet, I still encourage you to get crickets and things like that that your reptile is going to have to chase and hunt. Next are superworms, also called Mario worms. This is a feeder insect that everybody seems to be afraid of. A lot of people will tell you that you cannot feed these live to your uh, reptiles or small mammals or things like that, which simply isn't true. You just need to be cautious about who you're feeding it to. You should only feed superworms to animals that are going to be large enough to actually crush them when they put them in their mouth. Superworms are very big and they bite and they can bite you, which is why I always use tongs when dealing with them, and they can also bite your reptile. So big insects like, like this that bite if your reptile does not crush it when they're eating it, there is a potential that they could bite the inside of the stomach. So personally, I avoid feeding superworms to my geckos and things like that. This is food that I keep around for my bearded dragon. My chameleon would also get these when I had her. And then they're a favorite for uh, my sugar gliders and opossum as well as uh, hedgehogs. They also love these. And the good thing about those animals is that they chew these up when they're eating them. So the insect is not going to be alive once swallowed. So you do not need to crush the heads of these things before feeding them to your animals. Just avoid feeding them to things like small lizards, frogs, um, anything that's gonna be too small to actually crush them. Superworms are fairly easy to keep, but do you remember that they can chew through thin plastic like this? This is a deli cup that I got to bring them home from the pet store, uh, but I have to take them out of here because they can go through these holes and they can actually chew it to make it bigger if they cannot fit. So this is not a good thing to keep them in. If I'm going to keep them long term, I move them over to a very small critter keeper with oats and things like that. Also remember that you have to have food for them all the time because they will eat each other. Another thing is, is that these are not like mealworms. You cannot put them in the fridge, so don't try to freeze them or anything like that, um, they will die. You can actually breed your own superworms. You have to get them from where you get them as worms to let them form into beetles. And then after that, you can take care of their larva. But you do have to separate them during the different growth stages. And personally, I just think that this is a lot of work and it's not something that I would be interested in actually doing, but that's my personal opinion. And a lot of people breed superworms with no problem. Superworms are a very fatty food and are great for reptiles that need to gain weight 
or animals that just have slow reflexes, like for example, my bearded dragon, who is unable to catch food for himself. So they make really good food for animals like that that have certain issues where they're not able to hunt very well. One thing to understand with superworms though is that they do have a very hard exoskeleton and therefore they should be fed in moderation along with a variety of other food because it is possible for them to cause impaction because of that hard exoskeleton that is a little bit difficult to digest. Next are tomato hornworms, which are an excellent option for a lot of reptiles and small mammals. They are incredibly juicy, so they're good for hydration and they're also great for getting a reptile who's refusing food to actually eat. They can actually be pretty pricey, but they do have the nutritional value of several crickets. They're also high in calories, so they're great for helping put weight on, um, but they do grow very quickly. So if you're going to get these, make sure you only get enough that you can feed to your animals over the next few days, because depending on their size, they won't last very long, so they uh, they do die quickly. <laughs> Tomato hornworms are an excellent option for all different types of reptiles, small mammals, and marsupials. Sugar gliders love them. You can also use them for invertebrates like scorpions and spiders. Next, we have my peacock's favorite type of food, mealworms. Mealworms are easy to keep because you can store them in the fridge for long periods of time, making it so that you can have them available for your animals. They are small, they don't smell, they don't bite, and they are a great choice for many different types of animals, from birds that would naturally eat insects to small mammals, including rats, sugar gliders, opossums, as well as many different types of reptiles. They're easy to contain. They don't chew and climb out of things like superworms do. So you can actually put them in a small dish for your animals to be able to eat them from. You can find them in almost any pet store. But they are high in fat and low in calcium, making them not ideal to have as a regular part of the diet for a lot of these types of animals. And they do also have a hard exoskeleton like I was saying, that is possible to cause impaction. So they should be fed in moderation, but they make an excellent treat, especially for little guys like this. Many people find them easy to breed. You do have to separate them through the different stages in their growth, from pupa to worm to beetle, but a lot of people seem to have an easy time breeding them, and it's something that I'm considering and I might even do next year, but we'll see how it goes. What are you looking at? <laughs> You're gonna peck me, aren't you? And now, of course, let's dive into my love-hate relationship with crickets. Crickets are actually one of my favorite feeder insects, but I also do think they are incredibly gross. So let's go over the pros and cons of them and why I think they are so gross. Crickets are the most readily available feeder insect. You can find them at almost any pet store and you can use them for all sorts of animals, um, small mammals, marsupials, invertebrates like spiders, um, amphibians like frogs and salamanders, lots of different reptiles, um, birds that would naturally eat um, insects. So you're able to feed them to a lot of different animals and they're also a good protein source for humans and becoming more of a mainstream part of, of a human diet. That, that I do have a little bit of trouble with though. Here are some good things about crickets. They are cheap and easy to get. They provide your reptile and amphibian with environmental enrichment by encouraging hunting behavior. They are a good amount of protein and I found that they're the easiest feeder to dust with vitamins and calcium. Now the reason that I do not like crickets is I think that they are so gross. So I used to order a box of a thousand crickets, um, but I stopped doing that because I could not go through them fast enough and they would just uh, end up dying on me before I could actually get them fed. Uh, they stink so bad. They smell absolutely horrible, so I don't like that about them. So between the smell and the cannibalism, it just has really turned me off from crickets, and that's personally why I don't like them. I hate housing crickets long term um, because they smell, because they eat each other, because their lifespan is very short and for me, they grow too quickly uh, for me to be able to keep them long-term and to be able to actually you know, get them fed to my animals and all of that. 
so that's uh, one of the reasons too why, why I've never wanted to breed crickets. Um, but a lot of people do breed crickets, so that's just my personal opinion. There's a lot of people out there that breed their own crickets very successfully and don't really seem to have any problems or issues with it. There's also the issue of them carrying parasites and disease and things like that that comes up a lot. Um, I'm not really too worried about something like that because there are certain places that I would never buy crickets from. So you have to be careful about that and think about where you're getting them from and make sure that you trust the source that you get your crickets from. Um, so I haven't you know, had that problem uh, because I'm careful with it. And even though I hate crickets, I you know, complain about a lot of things having to do with crickets, they will always be part of my feeding routine with my animals because they encourage um, the hunting behavior and they give the reptiles environmental enrichment having to actually go and hunt their food and it encourages them to be active. So I love to feed them to animals like my um, crested geckos so that they're encouraged to actually be active and they're not um, just you know sitting still all the time. For some of my other animals, I actually choose to go with canned crickets, uh, for example with my hedgehogs or sugar gliders, just because the crickets can escape the cage. But when I had my opossum, I would actually put him in a Tupperware container with crickets in order to let him hunt and actually be able to catch them. And he really enjoyed that. Another amazing feeder is the calcium worm, also called the black soldier fly larva as well as uh, phoenix worms, I think is another name for it. So there's a, a couple of different names for that one on the market. Uh, I think it's because people are trying to kind of brand them as their own. This is a feeder that is incredibly high in calcium. They have way more calcium than any other type of feeder. So I think that's why they have a lot of names as each company is trying to be like, oh, this is, this is our cool thing. Um, but anywhere you get them from they're going to all be basically the same thing um, they are incredibly high in calcium they are also high in natural aluric acid and that is something that's really important to the system in being able to um, fight off viruses uh, fungus and bacteria so that's something that really adds a good health benefit to your reptiles the only bad thing is is that these calci worms or whatever you want to call them black soldier fly larvae are not very big and so for small animals this is fine but for your larger reptiles it does take a lot more of them to actually feed them black soldier fly larvae are probably one of the best uh, nutritional value insects that you can provide to your animals next to dubia roaches the difference is that they are incredibly difficult to breed compared to dubia roaches, but because of the value that they have, it's something that I would probably consider in the future. However, as beneficial as they are, I don't agree with the hype where you should replace all of your feeders with the black soldier fly larva. I think that they add a really good nutrition source to a diet that's a variety of insects. I don't think that you should replace everything with them. Um, I think that that's just something that you should definitely add to your reptiles diet. Next, let's talk about waxworms. This is an insect that makes a great addition to your reptile or, or small mammals diet because it is incredibly high in calcium. Uh, not nearly as high as the black soldier fly larva, but they do have a lot of calcium. The only other issue with them though is that they are also very high in fat, so they should be fed in moderation. But it can also be a good thing because they're a great uh, food source for animals that need to gain weight or animals that are refusing to eat. Uh, they're very soft and tender, so that kind of um, gets your reptile a little bit more intrigued in them. I've always noticed that my reptiles really enjoy waxworms and it seems to be kind of like a snack that they crave. Like I said, they have a soft body, kind of like a tomato hornworm. Uh, which makes them easy to digest and then you can also put them in the fridge so you can store them for long periods of time and have them on hand. So if you get um, large amounts of them you don't have to feed them all right away. You can just keep them for over several weeks and feed them as you go. Waxworms actually aren't too complicated to breed. It's kind of similar to mealworms and in fact um, waxworms are probably the next insect that I am going to try to breed for my own animals. And let's not forget about fruit flies. I feel like this doesn't really apply to a lot of people um, because not a lot of uh, reptiles and amphibians actually eat fruit flies. Um, but they are easy to find and they're an excellent food source for a lot of small animals 
like frogs. The fruit flies that are available in pet stores as feeders actually can't fly, so don't be worried about them invading your house or getting around everything. They actually can't fly. So they come in a deli cup and that has all of their food for them so you don't really have to do much of anything. They're actually very easy to breed if you want to just start um, preparing their own food and you know keep them going. If you buy a culture of them from the store you can actually use that as um, your, your source for breeding and just uh, keeping them keeping the thing going and as long as you keep putting food in there for them and they'll reproduce and all of that. Um, so they're fairly easy to actually breed. And then lastly, I did want to mention lobster roaches. Now, this is similar to dubia roaches. It has a lot of the same uh, kind of nutritional value. Uh, they don't smell, they don't make any noise. The difference though with them is that these roaches can climb on anything. They can climb on plastic, on glass, and so that really makes them a pain to keep. They escape easily. Uh, it does have the benefit of them being a little bit more active and therefore getting your reptile to chase them a little bit more. But then they also just try to get under something and then they won't come out and then your reptile can't get them. So uh, they're something that is popular, but I just don't see the point. Um, there's nothing better about them than Dubia and Dubia have so many more good qualities and just easy to keep that I don't think that lobster roaches are even worth it. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know which feeder insects are your favorites. And thank you to Levoid for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out their products down below in the description. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.